Sorry about the noise in the background. Um, the freezer's going, obviously it's a warm day, so uh, sorry. Anyway, look, this is probably gonna be one of the quickest videos I've ever done, and it's kind of vindicating you people that have been called tin foilers, conspiracy theorists, and all the rest of it. The evidence is starting to come out now, and it's making its way in front of senators in America. So have a little watch of this, and it's kind of putting it into perspective that they knew, they always knew, and uh, they're still pushing it. Why? That's the question. Why are they still pushing something that they now know is bad? Well, one reason and one reason only, money. Well, actually, no, that would be completely wrong, wouldn't it, really? Because if the tin foil that I wear every occasion, uh, well, occasionally, and obviously the theories that I have, if it is true, then it's money and then another thing. But I'm not mentioning that now because, well, you know, if I lose this channel, I won't be able to speak to you, will I? I've got another video coming as well about um, what I would call um, the Marxists trying to hasten their demise by their actions. But watch the video and I'll, I'll, you'll see what I mean. But it's very, very annoying. You have to come forward and give a name or I would not have allowed you to come. To yes, Senator. So we've got three whistleblowers who've given me permission at this point to share their name. Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Teresa Long, D-O-M-P-H. Dr. Samuel Sigloff and Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Peter Chambers, DO and flight surgeon. All three have, have given me this data. I have declarations from all three. This data is under penalty. Of, uh, this is under penalty of perjury. We intend to submit this to the courts. Uh, we have substantial data showing that uh, we saw, for example, uh, miscarriages increased by 300 percent over the five-year average, almost. Uh, we saw almost 300 percent increase in cancer over the five-year average. Cancer is not being talked about except for by Dr. Ryan Cole. Thank you, doctor. Uh, we saw, this one's amazing, neurological. So f neurological issues which would affect our pilots. Over a thousand percent increase. A so thousand. Ten, ten times. That's ten times the rate, and obviously that resonates. 83,000 per year, to, I'm sorry, 82,000 per year to 863,000 in one year. Our soldiers are being experimented on, injured, and sometimes possibly killed. Dr. Corey, thank you so much for your stance on the corruption. That's precisely what it is. They know this, and Senator, uh, when these doctors are attacked, not necessarily the people in this room, I'm give, not giving names, they call me. I'm the one dealing with the medical boards. I'm the one watching the witch hunts. I'm the one fighting them off and I'm the one telling them where to go. I'm going to keep doing that. Senator, we also have, uh, let me give you this last thing and then I'll shut up and uh, get out of your way. 928, 2021. Project Salus weekly report. Project Salus is a defense, a defense department initiative where they report and contra, uh, they take all this data that doesn't exist supposedly and they give it to the CDC. They're watching these vaccines. On that date and around that date, I have numerous instances where Fauci and that entire crew were saying it's a crisis of unvaxxed. It's 99% unvaxxed in the hospital. In Project Salus, in the weekly report, the DOD document, says specifically 71% of new cases are in the fully vaxxed and 60% of hospitalizations are in the fully vaxxed. This is corruption at the highest level. We need investigations. The Secretary of Defense needs investigated. The CDC needs to be investigated. And thank you so much, Senator, for having the courage to stand against these special interests. So, so again, the, the, department, the Department of Defense Thank you. The Department of Defense, the Biden administration is on notice. They must preserve these records and this must be investigated. Okay? Absolutely. Um, Thank you so much, Senator. Thank you. So the increase in cancer is something I've been hearing about for months. And quite honestly, I've told people that are reporting this to me. I don't think the public's quite ready for that yet, okay? But you've just raised this issue. Apparently, uh, Dr. Cole, you're aware of this. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because this, this, is, this is frightening. Thank you, Senator. And this is a challenge in terms of aggregating data. I saw a signal early on of certain viral conditions. You know, Dr. Parks pointed out mechanisms. I noticed certain viruses increasing. Well, these same T cells, immune cells, keep cancers in check. So. 
I do about 40,000 biopsies a year. I'm, I'm a busy pathologist. And I thought, gosh, I'm seeing more of this type of cancer and this type of cancer and this type of cancer. And so I've tried to talk to other laboratories and aggregate a bigger data set, which obviously these federal data sets are a very easy way to see that signal. Obviously, I've been canceled, I've been ridiculed, I've been uh, maligned, et cetera, for saying so, but I've been observing it. And I can't deny observation. That's how science happens initially through observation. Then we confirm through hypothesis, experiment, and data. So yes, we're seeing it. And now when we travel with these groups and summits, I have oncologists, I have radiation oncologists. I am seeing an uptick in cancers. I'm seeing these odd, stable cancers take off like wildfires after the vaccines. It is happening. We need federal funding. The NIH isn't looking at this. Getting a grant to look at anything related to the vaccines is next to impossible because they're perfect, safe, and effective. So it's happening. My data is anecdotal. My observational group is significant, but we need additional studies to happen. And thank you to Tom for digging so, into so what's can, actually we, happening. I think we have some additional nurses. And by the way, that's where I was getting the safety signal from. Nurses from across the country are contacting me about the, the vaccine mandates, that type of thing, talking, you know, telling me why they're not going to get the vaccine because they're seeing this, these patients that their cancers were in remission, then, you know, all of a sudden, boom, you know, they, they're blossoming again. Dr. Russo, quickly. Yeah, I've got a question I want uh, Dr. Cole to address. Um, Ryan, you know that um, the experimental data on the genome in the P53 in BRCA, can you explain that to everyone? Yeah, real quick. So we have genes in our body. We have mechanisms in our body. We have bad cells in our body every day. Our body says, oh, I can kill that, knock it off, you know, shakes hands with every cell, you're gone, you're gone, you're a bad cell. There are genes, there are suppressor genes, P53, it's the guardian of our genome. There's another breast cancer gene, BRCA gene. We know that the spike protein binds to the receptors for these genes and can activate them. That is a mechanism of the spike protein. So putting this spike protein in the human body via a a gene shot that is completely investigational, these are not approved, and to mandate something that's investigational that can bind to cancer promoting sites. I'd like to just yeah, clarify and take that a step forward. Because P, what P53 does is it checks your DNA yes. before it replicates, and it makes sure that it's fixed. So P53 is the one tumor suppressor gene that is most um, tied to cancer because once there's a mutation in p53 the mutation rate just skyrockets Correct. and you're going to develop enough mutations that that cancer is going to have a much more likelihood of becoming metastatic absolutely so correct. p53 is the essential tumor suppressor now do we know for sure that um, the spike protein is binding it and inactivating it so that it cannot make sure that your dna is replicated um, effectively and and without any errors no but that's why we should have tested these for cancer causing potential before we started giving them to our kids. There are some confirmatory can, can I, can I, studies. Yeah, I'll put it into the record, a yes. uh, paper by Jiang in May, yes. uh, where it goes into this data. <clears throat> SARS-CoV-2 spike impairs DNA damage repair. Thank you. you, you the, the key, one of the key points is, is we, do, we still don't officially know what the structure of these, of these so-called vaccines are. I mean, we, we, we do have some information now that's been published by a Nobel laureate uh, group uh, from uh, Stanford looking at the sequence from discards and, and comparing it with, uh, with, the, with the patterns. And, and, and there are what are called untranslated regions. Has anyone ever heard of this word, untranslated region? Anyone? Yes. A few people. Okay, everyone has been told that the RNA in there is just RNA that's making this spike protein that's going to make your nice little cute little vaccine, just like those mumps and polio vaccines that we've all had as, as, a ch as children. No, wrong. There are untranslated regions, and I'm going to read you what they are. There's, 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 there are three human gene sequences in those untranslated regions. One of them, we think, I'm working with a group of molecular biologists and genomics, one of them, we think, is targeting the mitochondria. I'll tell you what that gene sequence is. It is a, where is it? The three prime untranslated region comprises two sequence elements derived from the amino terminal enhanced of split ASMRNA and the mitochondrial encoded 12S ribosomal RNA to confirm RNA stability and high total protein expression. That's what, that's what, that's what a WHO document says. Now, if that's true, 
If that's true, that, that could mean, we don't know, we need to find out, that could mean that the expression of the spike protein is actually being expressed, partly at least, in ribosomal, in mitochondrial ribosomal. Uh, this is so wrong. Right, 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 mitochondrial yeah, no, ribosomal. No, no, no. Yeah. That, means, that one, means it could be a kamikaze first expression. First of all, we, you know, Dr. Wiseman, listen. You're certainly letting us know you're qualified, but I don't know what you're talking about. But, but, <laughs> well, what so I'm talking I, about, Senator, is clarify. what I'm talking about, Senator, is in every single drug in package insert, you see a chemical structure. Don't do you not? There is a chemical structure. We need to know the exact chemical structure, the exact <clears throat> sequence of the RNAs and the DNAs in these vaccines. Right. Okay, they are being withheld from us. FDA needs to show us what those structures are. It needs to explain what the pseudouridine is doing. You need. They, they need to explain this paper from Sahih. Who is the who is the founder of BioNTech in in 2019? Excuse me, 2014. They talk about non-natural nucleosides. What are those non-natural nucleosides doing? He talks about the toxicity of them, the pseudouridine. None of that is being discussed. So, None of that. So, so I, I, I want to clarify a little bit. I agree there. with you. Okay. We need a lot more information. I want to clarify because people have said this are mRNA vaccines. MRNA only always goes to protein, and we can't do anything. First, we know that people have re reverse transcriptase. Yes, it can make DNA. Yes, it can go back into the DNA. But there's something else about RNA. RNA can make little hairpin loops. RNA can regulate your DNA. So when you put an mRNA vaccine or RNA into your body, it can get in, and it can be alternately spliced, it can bind to your DNA, and it can regulate it for positive or for negative. It can change your gene expression, and there's stuff in there that can can do that either intentionally or unintentionally, and we don't know. It's completely unethical because we are just beginning to understand MR, the RNA silencing where these RNA molecules regulate our DNA. So that makes it completely we, we, unethical to use this technology. We, we have to get on to, uh, there are great unknowns with respect to the vaccines, uh, their mechanism of action, and uh, disease categories like cancer uh, but there is a disease category upon which the FDA, the CDC, and all stakeholders agree that the vaccines cause, and that's myocarditis or heart inflammation. And I will tell you, as a cardiologist, it is crystal clear that these vaccines cause myocarditis. Dr. Uh, Parks has already quoted the paper by Avolio that has shown, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the vaccines cause myocarditis. The FDA indicates for Pfizer and Moderna that they cause myocarditis. We now have over 200 papers in the peer-reviewed literature on myocarditis. Sadly, showing the rates of myocarditis are far in excess of what the CDC ever imagined. We've identified that boys are uh, have a predilection for this far more than girls. The maximum age group, the peak age group is age 18 to, uh, 18 to 24, so it's actually the college age. The risk extends up to age 50. And I can tell you that in this age group, it is clear the risks of the vaccines are far greater than the risks of COVID-19, the respiratory illness. Two papers, one by Tracy Hogue at UC Davis, one by Ron Kostoff, that these papers have been presented at the FDA meetings. They have not been challenged as analyses. One, and, and there are now fatal cases of myocarditis per, uh, 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 published by Washington University in St. Louis, by Verma, and by Choi from South Korea. More fatal cases accrue. There is uh, the father of a boy here in this room who's died of myocarditis. One death is too many. One. One, we have 21,000 cases of myocarditis and climbing in the United States that the CDC has verified. One was too many. Under no circumstances, under any circumstances, should a young person ever receive one of these vaccines, let alone ever be pressured to receive a vaccine, let alone ever be mandated to take a vaccine. This is crystal clear. The FDA agrees. There can be no controversy over this. There can be no normalizing of this to say that it's mild or it's transitory. Well, talk, talk about that because they is, say it's mild. Talk, is myocarditis mild? My, I'm telling you as a specialist, myocarditis is not mild. There are papers by Shower and by now by Trong at University of uh, Utah at Salt Lake. When they do MRI on these individuals with suspected myocarditis, 100% are having heart damage. 
100%. We have a paper by Tashopi and colleagues looking at the outcome of individuals prior to COVID in this age group with myocarditis. 13% will have permanent heart injury. 32% never actually get up to normal. They don't get back to normal. We are seeing unprecedented numbers of athletes dying on the field in Europe. Unprecedented. Of these cardiac arrests, half of them don't come back. We now have a report out of the heart group in the UK where actuarial mortality for those under age 15, mortality in the UK is higher than expected. Which Doc, uh, Dr. Malone. Just real uh, quick, going back, yeah, Mr. Could, Rounds. I wonder if Dr. Malone could follow just, up on just, that. Just real yeah. quick, because we're talking yeah. about myocarditis. What concerns me so much about the whistleblower report there is this is the only vaccine injury that the CDC, FDA are acknowledging. And you combine that with the fact that there's at least suspicions that the Defense Department is doctoring with the data in their database affecting myocarditis. I mean, I'm sorry, that just, that gets my suspicion antenna. And the, and the recommendations and the mandates are ignoring the FDA warnings. I would... I would contend, Senator, that there's not just a suspicion. In August, when the report was run on acute myocarditis in the DOD website, there were 1,239 cases, and now when you run it, it's down to 307. In January of 2022, there were 176 cases, and magically, they are now down to 17. There is a word for that. It's not suspicious. We have in the military the single best data set we that exists because we have baselines in there and acute disease across all categories in the preceding years five years leading up to the vaccination year was 1.7 million they introduced and mandated a COVID-19 vaccine for our U.S. military when they had only lost 12 service members total to the disease and in the 10 months of 2021 after that it jumped from 1.7 million all diseases to darn near 22 million that was a 20 million increase. We need to not be calling this suspicious. With all due respect, we need to be asking hard questions of the DOD, and I will close by saying they are charged, at least in part, with protecting the sanctity and welfare of the brave men and women who are defending this country. And right now, these numbers indicate something is drastically wrong. And I know of only one reason that databases roll math backwards. So who are you? Identify yourself. So sorry. My name is Lee Dundas. I'm a human rights attorney that's working with Tom Rents on the whistleblower issue in the military. I would ask that Congress listen to these whistleblowers, put their testimony on record. These are brave men and women of very high rank in the U.S. military because not just do we, Congress, in this building need to hear about it, the world needs to hear about what is 